So first of all, I want to point out to the class, because there's a lot of foreigners here. Here is a Polish immigrant. <laughs> here is an Israeli immigrant. And we did OK. <laughs> right? So there's You're almost an immigrant. You're like an Italian, right? <laughs> uh, my father was born in Greece. Um, okay. I get half credit. <laughs> So um, the first question I wanted to ask you is um, when I ask you what movie you wanted to show, you, cho you chose Munich. You did so many amazing movies, and you chose Munich. And I'm a, a bit curious why you chose. It was a simply, simply a, a choice of, of not seeing this movie for a long time. Right? <laughs> I just wanted to see that movie. Projected. Exactly. I was hoping it's going to be projected, but DVD was pretty good, so it's not bad. It's very. And, you know, it's we met during the during the diving bell and a butterfly screening, so I didn't want to show that film right. because I just saw it. So um, was diving bell, Munich, or um, AI, which is the artificial intelligence, and I went for Munich simply because I felt maybe more rele more relevant to what's happening now. Yeah, it's funny because when Ron Howard came here, I used to work for Ron and. Uh, he came because he said he didn't see American graffiti for so long, so he really wanted to see it again. So we're providing opportunities for our guests also to reconnect with their work. Right. That's great. <laughs> it's nice to see it with audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did you get to work with Spielberg? I shot a little movie directed by Diane Keaton. That was, I think, 1990. It was a television movie. Stephen liked the work, called my agent. We met, and he offered me to do a television movie for his company, Tele television, television movie directed by Gregor Hablet called Class of 61, which was a Civil War movie that deals with the West Point graduates in 1861. And after that, um, he offered me Schindler's List. So pretty much like that. <laughs> but I was a really hard-working boy when I was in film school. So it wasn't just like he found me on the streets of Krakow, you know, and brought me to America. I mean, I, I was here for, for 13 years, and, and I've shot six, seven movies, you know. So I was rather experienced. I just didn't have that little push, you know. And I yeah. got a little push from him. So let me ask you something. Did, he, did the movie with uh, Diane Keaton, um, was he connected to it, or he no, somehow no, no. He, he, he watches television. He likes television, you know? Exactly. Uh, that's the way he, he connects with the world, by watching television. He loves television. And he saw it on television. He right. really liked the movie. Right. I know composers that got work right. because he saw their movie late at night right. on television and said, who is that composer? So um, I just want to say one more thing, and then I'll just let him do it. It's um, my office when I started out was above Spielberg mm -hmm. at MGM. And no matter how late I worked, he worked right. later. Boy, he's a very hardworking man. He's the most hardworking person that I've ever met. The, move, the moment we finish the movie, within two weeks from the wrap, he's got a f pretty good final cut. So, <laughs> so he works weekends, he works during lunch, he works after work. Yeah. So all the fame and the money he deserves. The other ones, not necessarily deserve, but he really deserved it. Uh, well, uh, first of all, um, I think on behalf of uh, all the cinematography students here, I'd really like to thank you for uh, coming in and uh, joining us. And from like Venice also, all the way from Venice. Uh, Venice, oh, California. Ven <laughs> well, you know, any, anyone that will venture out from the west side to visit us, I think, uh, deserves a round of applause. And <laughs> And uh, thank you, Tova, for, for letting me uh, uh, share the stage with you tonight. Um, I think my first question is kind of a broader one, which is that um, leading up to Schindler's List, um, Spielberg had a really formidable collaboration with Alan Davio uh, and produced um, many um, iconic films. And um, starting a collaboration with Stephen, were you haunted at all by um, that body of work? Did, did you have any kind of dialogue, if you will, with, with that body of work? No, not really. I was pretty naive when I, when I started working with Stephen. I really didn't know what it meant for my career and for my life in general to be associated with him and work on the movies with him. So I was very naive. Now I'll be very scared, but, but at that <laughs> point, I was just, you know, I saw another filmmaker 
whose work I admired and I liked. I knew that I've got something offered to him that he liked and admired. So that was the base of our relationship, which was uh, trust, a little bit of an infatuation with each other's work. And that relationship evolved in a bit of a friendship that lasted since 1993. Um, I mean, obviously, I knew that his visual sense was super, superb and still continues being continues to be superb and i like the cinematographers he worked with but i wasn't really you know i wasn't really intimidated or or afraid or or felt out of the league i just you know that i have to do good work and that's what he respected you know good work whatever it means a good work <laughs> and um l looking back uh at, at your your body work with Stephen, I, I, I feel like there's definitely um, a thread that runs through um, um, all those movies. Certainly, uh, uh, with uh, some of the bleach bypass work you were right. doing, um, and uh, there's um, uh, there's a there's a particular um, quality to um, all uh, all those movies, regardless of the um, topic, that I think is instantly recognizable, at least to anyone that's mindful of of cinema. Um, is that something that happened by design, or is it something just that, that evolved from picture to picture? Well, I think each story has its own representation. Of course, I'm the one that, that puts my own little imprint. Not consciously, I'm not sitting there and thinking, okay, this is what I'm going to do, because that's what I do. It's just I express myself uh, through cinematography, and, and it's apparently to you and others, it's very uh, uh, obvious that, that there are certain... Um, resemblance from one movie to another or certain motifs or elements from each movie to another but at the same time you know he makes essentially the same movies you know occasionally when he makes Jurassic Park or, or War of the Worlds but War of the Worlds is nothing but guy who's trying to connect with his with his kids you know Schindler's is about guy who who discovers humanity um, you know E.T. is about this little kid who who discovers tolerance so I mean all these movies are essentially they've got very similar team and, and, and a few years ago, we watched Beretta, and I think he directed a couple of the Beretta, I think. And I was just laughing because we're doing the same shots. I mean, you know, <laughs> the same shots as in Beretta. So, you know, we don't really change dramatically. We just refine certain things, you know. Um, but, you know, as a filmmaker, I think he, he expresses himself through directing, uh, even when he's making these high-budget, extremely commercial movies there is still part of him that he allows the viewers to learn about. You know, it's the same to my work, I think. If you could go back um, to uh, Saving Private Ryan, would you still um, create as much of that um, image uh, photochemically? Sure. Or, or uh, would, would you work more with the DI? No, I would do it photochemically. I would do it on camera. I would do it 100% real, same like I did on on Diving Bell on a Butterfly. And the reason I showed Diving Bell on a Butterfly on the previous engagement I've done is because people were really not aware that so much work can be done um, live, means, you know, photochemically and through uh, manipulation of, of the image, manipulation of the image uh, as the image is being being recorded, you know. Same with Saving Private Ryan. I mean, I think there's the problem of this generation, generation of the, not my generation, but, but the slightly younger generation, it's the generation that is afraid to think as an individual person. You know, I came here because of the individualism. And now for, for the last 30 years, you've been all told, do not stand out, think as a group, don't take chances, don't, you know, be part of it. You know, almost like a, a, a Japanese society to some degree, and we're truly seeing results of it. So, no, I would not. I would do photochemically again. <laughs> and what's your impression of the uh, what's your impression of the DI in general? Is it do you, do you feel like well, it's, it's a necessary better. evil? I mean, it's getting better. No, it's not evil. It's very, it's very useful tool. Um, it just you know depends who is the guy who's doing the little controls. Mm -hmm. If the guy who's doing the little controls has film experience, and frankly, is it really important anymore whether he's got film experience or not? Because the audience really doesn't know what the film looks like anymore. But there's some people that say there's something magical about negative against negative, a you know photochemical optical print uh, that could never be uh, recreated by by scanning and then outputting. That's not true. It can be recreated. It could be even better. So. Um, <laughs> uh, well, let's double back and talk about this movie in particular. Um, I saw a lot of zooms there. Uh, was that a kind of homage to the 1970s? But Toma is the one that she's the expert in the 70s, you know, <laughs> so she can tell you. Yeah, the zooms are really. Uh, 
present in this movie simply because the zoom lens was invented around that the time in the 70s so everyone was really zoom happy you know mm -hmm. you were zooming in zooming out and became the part of the 70s vocabulary and since this movie takes place in the 70s you know we try to employ the same technique to some degree you know remember the movie blow up sure Sure. Uh, blow up is the um, one with um, the mimes. Uh, blow out is the one with John Travolta. In case you're confusing too. No, it's not a bad neither. The John Travolta one. Um, and I think looking at some behind the scenes pictures, we're using the the cook uh, the ten to one. You know, I don't really remember. You know, okay. that's not my. I, I don't really think of. The, the, you know, the cam I, I look at cameras as a sewing machine. So mm -hmm. when you do thing, you know, when you talk to the wardrobe designer, you don't ask her what kind of sewing machine do you, you use because it's just it's a sewing machine. It pulls down. <laughs> it doesn't really matter, you know. The equipment, all that stuff, it's not. You know, what you do with it is it's essential, but not necessarily, you know, the type of a light and stuff. You know. So, so your choice to go with Ari instead of Panavision for Munich wasn't um, that didn't affect no, just things sentiment, at all. No, sentiments. You go to Europe, you work with the European equipment. You know. <laughs> That's 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 all. Um, so you've done a couple of historical films that that are very iconic, um, you know, and and some people might even argue that when you make a film like Schindler's List or when you um, make a film like Saving Private Ryan, Saving Private Ryan, oh, parts. Um, that in in some ways, I mean, you're very much in, in informing. We're very much informing people's um, recollection of that time period, particularly for those folks that um, weren't around uh, to experience it firsthand. Um, do you carry any kind of sense of responsibility when you're creating those images? No, because the, the way I look at the, the images that influence me are images, let's start from, from the beginning. The way what influences me are the images that hopefully were taken during the particular period, right? I mean, of course, if you're talking about 1890 and slavery, there are not that many photos, and the images were very deteriorated, or, you know, uh, period movies. But if you're talking about Second World War, there's a definitely very large library of images that you can use as your resource, right? But the problem with those images is that, you know, if you're a combat cameraman and you're sitting there in the field, you're not going to be running with that camera because then you're going to get shot, right? So you sit behind the rack or behind some kind of a obstruction. You've got a long lens, and and you capture the images that way. Well, we're, we were not creating dangerous situations, so I was able to come up with visual style that allows the audience to feel like they participating in the war. So the camera was handheld. Usually, the camera was just one single camera following. The actors, you know, when the actors fell down, the operator would fill down, that kind of stuff. The explosions were happening left and right. So you had this immediacy of the war that frequently combat cameramen would not be able to convey simply because they would not expose themselves to that kind of a danger. You're looking at documentary footage, and of course, you understand intellectually how powerful the war was, but you're really not feeling emotionally what that war feels like. And then again, our recollection of, of you know, of periods, you know, the you know, 1890s, warm 70s, fluorescent and ugly, that kind of stuff. So um, war is usually black and white, particularly the, the Second World War, but they just discovered recently a large library, library of George Stevens's color movies, and they were amazing. It's amazing to see war in color. And I did, a, I did an interview a few years ago about the beauty of the war. Can war be beautiful? Well, intellectually, it cannot be beautiful because we all, we're all dying, people are dying and all that stuff, but visually, it's, it's a stunning experience. Explosions, blood, colors, you know, and the grid, you know, it's just really, really visually stimulating. Um, it's not beautiful, it's just visually stimulating the war. A um, couple of practical questions. What advice would you give these young cinematographers uh, for using smoke? Use it. Use it. <laughs> How about keeping it consistent? Depends what kind of movie you're making. If you're making a short little movie and you've got, you know, you're cutting every three, four seconds, you have a smoke, you know, it doesn't really matter. You know, if you're making longer shots and the shots lasting a minute, minute and a half, then you have to keep the consistency because halfway through we'll lose the smoke, right? You'll lose the smoke. So you have a guy who's just going to feed the smoke during the take, you know? And don't be afraid of digital this and digital that. I did this little television thing, you know, it's called the event. We shot digitally and we used, we used smoke and, and it's very interesting. Use filters, put filters on digital cameras. It's really, it really makes the image more interesting. Not necessarily better or worse or closer to film, it just makes the image more interesting. 
and shoot. You know, if you don't have money to shoot with video cameras, shoot stills, you know, make yourself an assignment. Okay, today I'm gonna take 20 frames that tells the, that tells the story from the beginning to the end, you know, whatever it is. My girlfriend uh, getting ready to go to wherever she's going, right? You know, that kind of stuff. Stop tweeting, take some pictures. <laughs> so, I took a bath this morning. Uh, take a picture. Excellent. So, so what do you do uh, with actors that don't hit their marks? How do you handle that? Oh, that's part, that doesn't happen anymore. Doesn't happen anymore. It's just that's such an old, that's such an old uh, way of making movies, you know, hitting marks, it's just, you know. I mean, you don't expect from the actors to hit, to hit marks unless, you know, they're about to, you know, fall off the, you know, cliff mm. or something. Um, and I saw. Uh, usually, I think you work with uh, um, uh, Devlin's your your gaffer. I right. think you worked with a different gaffer on right. Munich. Can you um, tell folks how you uh, tend to work with your department heads, uh, particularly the gaffer? Are you are you calling out particular units? No, you can because it's simply the scope is way too large. You can't really you know, demand every light to be placed on the set according to your desire. So you have a gaffer who is knowledgeable, who is interested in doing lighting, and you get some gaffers who are more intellectual and others are much more, you know, uh, technical, they just do the lights. And then on the shooting day or day before, you talk about the, the specifics of each scene and you change the lighting, particularly the lighting of the main section of the scene or you adjust the lighting or you do the lighting with the gaffer on the given day right after the rehearsal but if you're lighting three silly, three silly blocks you know you can't really you know you just generalist you know don't make a backlight or, i don't want to be backlightish or you say i want a backlight i want this to feel you know too romantic i want to be blue green you know like the grease was very yellow which is very interesting this movie to to play with the colors because you have to let, allow the audience immediately identify where they are so if you're not using some strong very strong metaphors or visual uh, 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 visual metaphors i guess uh, you will lose the audience. So the first explosion was very yellow. Then we go to France, it's a little bit more bluish. Then we go to uh, Be Israel, it's very still blue, you know, that kind of stuff. So immediately you want it to be, you go to Ro it Italy, it's very warm and fuzzy. France is very warm and fuzzy. So using those visual cliches that we as the people identify uh, with specific countries, you know, uh, Israel, warm, sunny, you know, Iceland, you know, day, all day you get light, you know, <laughs> dark and at night, you know, blah, blah, blah. Russia, gray and smoky, you know. Uh, France, you know, bluish kind of, you know, that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, so yeah, you let the gaffer do as much as he can on his own because if he doesn't, then you're going to fall behind and you have to do more work. So surround your people, surround yourself with the best people so you can work less. And I want to work as little as possible, <laughs> yeah. um, you know. Except when I'm on the set, then I work as much as I can. But I don't, I, I don't like pre-productions. I don't like going on location scouts and you know, just walking, talking about the cable. Uh, well, um, speaking of which, it seemed like there are a lot of practical locations in Munich. Right, the, whole, yeah. the whole movie is almost practical. Right. So um, when you are, um, and it seems like a rudimentary thing, but it's, it's done so expertly. When you're in a practical location you need to, and you need to balance your levels to... Uh, what's going on outside the windows, and I, I think that first time we saw a gold in my ear, uh, there was some really uh, great use of that. Um, are you silking everything outside, or are you just constantly metering out the windows and adjusting to match? Yeah, you know, I mean, let's talk about the, uh, the the sequences where I'm inside the car and shooting through the through the back window and seeing the people in the through the back window, and then you rack focus to the mirror in the foreground, and and that mirror sees the, it's, it was a bit of a nightmare because you have to constantly balance, and you lose light on the mirror, you lose on the glass, you lose light on the glass, then you have to light the people outside, then you have to light the people inside, it becomes problematic. <laughs> Why do you do it? You know. So it's even for you, it's just a, it's just a matter of keeping track of the exposures. Yeah, of and course. And knowing that I have to see things because I'm, we're on location, it would be nice to see the walls outside. It would be nice to know that we are on location, not on the movie set, you know. Um, and even though we did have one, lo one movie set built, which was the uh, Mossad, but still that was built on location. Um, so yeah. And you, do you find that you, you gravitate towards working at a certain light level or a certain foot candle, or it's just different per situation? Depends, you know, depends on, on how um, difficult the shot may be for the focus puller, you know. You don't want to go 
uh, pull out from the extreme close-up of an, of an eye to wide shot and shoot it at 2.8, you want to give them a little bit more. You want to be kind to them, you know. So at least they can they can achieve the success rather than failing. Although I'd guess maybe that uh, Steve Meisler could probably work at any any well, stop. Finished him, I tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> he left. <laughs> um, how about uh, using Super 35 on this instead of Scope? It's just the grain. I want a grain, and it's easier and and less light and less complicated. And you know, you go you go with Super 35 inside the car. You've got different uh, different minimal focus versus the, the the anamorphic lenses which are bigger and minimal fo minimal focus is three feet you know becomes complicated mm -hmm. you know? um i remember um i was talking to um i was spoken i was talking to alan davio and he said that um uh working with steven uh you're filming every sunrise and every sunset because uh he's always convinced that the next one uh would be prettier than the one you just shot you must have been very lucky because <laughs> i've missed so many sunsets <laughs> and we'll be driving home at the best light it's like okay here we're going home again beautiful sunset um so he's you know, i mean he's changed his his aesthetics i think you know we evolve you know and he became more interested with in in, in more realism i guess you know I Maybe Alan likes the sunsets, you know. I like the sunsets, but. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we open it up for students to ask questions? Anybody has the nerve to ask questions, please? Don't be bashful. You have to stand up. Why are you making it easier for them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would eliminate me right now. Exactly. Um, hi, Janos. Um, I just wanted to find out what do you look for in a director cinematographer relationship? What are those key things that you think are really important to have? I think for me it's very important that he, he tells good stories, you know, uh, whatever the, that story is. It doesn't have to be a linear story, but I just like uh, a director who, who is interested in storytelling, not necessarily in just entertaining people, but, but telling the stories, you know. And, and sometimes you get the chance to work with other direct, other directors outside Steven um, who are good storytellers, and sometimes um, not, you know. Um, and I, I don't want him to be my friend. I don't want him to be, you know, I, I also want the director to respect me, respect my work, and realize my contribution and realize my years of experience and, and not to be afraid. And the fear is a paralyzing thing for many directors. And I want him to, I want him or her to have good aesthetics, you know, whatever that means, you know. Um, you know. I, I have a second question. I just, um, when the, one of the first films I saw that you had um, done cinematography on um, was Schindler's List, and it's such a moving story. Um, I just wanted to know what your experience was like filming that. I mean, being in Poland, um, I'm pretty close to the story myself because my family's Polish and so there's a lot of history there. I mean, what did you feel filming it? Well, I mean, it was very emotional simply because I've not been to Poland for 13 years. I left as a young fellow with, you know, pretty much zero in my pocket. And I came back with Spielberg to make a movie. And I left during the communism, came back at the early stage of uh, democracy. Um, was very emotional. Very, I was very much interested in being in Poland, and I learned a lot about. I learned a lot about Holocaust. You know, we, we as the Poles, we're not being taught about Holocaust. You know, we're being told about the Second World War, and the destruction that the war created on various uh, ethnicities, such as Gyps Gypsies, Slavs, Germans, Russians, and Jews. But we were not really focusing. Um, that we were not focusing on, on, on Holocaust towards, towards Jewish people, right? So that was an ex extremely uh, uh, um, revealing experience, you know. Um, it was very emotional at first, and then pretty quickly I realized that it's basically it's the same country that it used to be. You know, and I still have the same sentiment to some degree. Um, my generation is the generation that, that's running the country, and, and your generation will improve the country, you know. Right now it's still a little bit a little bit tough, you know. There's some great people there. It's 40 million people. You're bound to find, you're bound <laughs> to find some great people. Thank you very much. Sure. The next one. 
And better be prepared because he's being filmed. <laughs> Hello. Uh, talking about colors in the films, uh, there are some filmmakers like uh, Krzysztof Keslowski or, uh, uh, sorry, director of photography Estorado. They're using a lot of colors to just change emotions and something like that. Are you thinking in use it in the some of your movies or? Sure. I mean, I've co I've colors are. Uh, Part of the artistic expression, right? Um, to some degree, black and white is much easier because you you don't have to, you don't have color, so uh, so you don't operate on that level. When you have color, you have to organize colors and make some kind of a story, right? And Storato was like the first cinematographer who really brought the whole uh, uh, intellectual concept of using the color in movies, right? Um, and he was not inventing the genre. Anyone who anyone who was not inventing the subject, anyone who reads a little bit about psychology, will realize the influence of certain colors on on our behavior. Mm -hmm. He was just the one who verbally uh, uh, explained to most of the viewers or viewers who wanted to know about it what he was doing in terms of the colors. So blue, sad, red, and red, anger, blah 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 blah. I'm more interested in what happens when you have, you know, when you change things, you know. Mm -hmm. where you don't make the blue to be sad, but blue could be happy as well, right? Sure. So when you, when you, yeah. What happens when you do a period movie and rather than having beautiful period images, you go into handheld and you do it really greedy and ugly, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. that, I'm interested in that, those things, you know? So I, I, I use color, I know co about color, and I try to organize color in, in some kind of a manner that, manner that tells the story. But um, it's also to go against the uh, uh, cliches and against ex against expected results, you know. Okay. What would you say uh, the best example of Storaro using color? Well, all his movies were great. I yeah. mean, I think, you know, 1980, not what's the one? Uh, the Conformist was pretty amazing. Yes. Right? Yeah, the best example. Yeah. Sure. Cinematographers, any questions? Or obviously for each individual film you have like different inspirations depending on the story or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, for this particular, uh, what were your inspirations? I mean, like talking about the zooms earlier, um, is there any other specifics? Well, the whole color palette. palette. Mm -hmm. You have to work with certain certain uh, color that, that, that represents the 70s. And of course, what, what represents the 70s are the movies of the 70s. It's the, yeah. it's the uh, vanishing point. It's the... Uh, uh, Panic in the Needle Park, the Midnight Cowboy, the Taxi Driver, it's not necessarily, yeah, Taxi Driver, and um, what's the other one um, with Popeye driving, French Connection. French Connection, I think, was one of the bigger influences because of the of the color. But then you've got, you get the Ip, Ip Chris Files, which was which was a movie directed by, by uh, Sidney Fury, which was pretty amazing film, and then you get, get Carter. So there are a lot of inspiration. It's not necessarily that I was borrowing the scenes, but all those great movies in the 70s that basically made me w wanting to come to America, because my per perception of America was built uh, based on watching American movies from the 70s. Mm -hmm. So I kind of remember what that felt, you know, and just watching few, what that felt when I was sitting in Poland watching movies in the 70s, so I kind of imagine what America must have been. So when I was just watching this movie here, I'm thinking, wow, this movie really feels like the 70s. Oh, it takes place in the 70s, guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt uh, just for me, I succeeded in creating or recreating that kind of a feel of the 70s, you know. And the cars, I mean, it's not that hard to create period feel, period look. You put you put a couple of cars, you put people in funny haircuts yeah. and wardrobe, and you've got a sense of the period, right? Yeah. Um, I think what's interesting is to to restrain yourself from going too far, like like um, what Harry Savinis did in in the movie with, the, with in the movie with Denzel Washington about the drug dealer, right? What was it called? American. American. American Gangster, I think Harris did this fantastic job. He totally restrained himself, he wasn't flashy, he wasn't really showing off, and he really uh, uh, conveyed the period. Nobody paid attention <laughs> but uh, to his work because it was just so, uh, so right and so perfect, you know? So you have to be a little bit flashy so people can look at it and <laughs> see, wow, this is good work, you know? <laughs>
and uh, on a more, uh, I mean, obviously, Diving Bell and the Butterfly is not a period piece. Uh, what about that one for inspiration? Well, for inspiration for that movie, I've used the book, and you always use this. You always use the script. You know, I mean, it's all in the script if you read it properly, and if you have the right director. You know, I mean, you know, with with the wrong director, Diving ben, Bell and Butterfly could become very schmaltzy, very kind of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, soft film. Yeah. So when I met with Schnabel, I wanted to know whether he's interested in making a coherent movie, simply because sometimes with artists, they want to be too experimental. And I don't want to do Stan Brakhage movie. I, wanna, I wanted to make a, make a movie that, that has a story, a movie that, that has audience. And, and I wanted to do it with an artist or with a director who is interested in making the movie for audience, not just for his friends. You know? mm -hmm. And Julian definitely wanted to make a movie for audience. And I felt he succeeded 100%. But he was also not interested in conventional storytelling. You know? And that collaboration ended up, ended, up, ended up being very beneficial for both of us, you know, in terms of making a good movie. Not in, not in terms of making money, yeah. but in terms of making a good movie. Uh, of course. <laughs> it's right. very challenging. And we made no money, actually. <laughs> <laughs> a small little movie. OK. Next one. Oh. Have I read yet? No. <laughs> I have a, OK. While he's going, I have a question for you. When you said that you uh, don't like all this pre-production and you know so and so forth, so how did you how do you get the work done? When do you, you hire the right people who work for you? And you so hire they the great go, gaffer, they great go kicker, for they go and they, no, they, they call go you and yeah. they say, I, mean, I go hey. scout, of course, but then I scout with them. Then they go three, four times again, and and they tell me what they what the intentions are and I say mm -hmm, that's good you know okay they say well you're gonna have to fight for us in terms of the equipment okay <laughs> <laughs> okay I thought maybe you just show up no, the no, day no, no. of the shoot no, 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 that's they water. say okay do this this okay but the movies are so massive you know you just I mean you get previous and you look at the previous and it's like how am I gonna do the shot you know I, I have no idea so let other people figure out who actually know how to do it you know? <laughs> mm. Hi. Um, you mentioned you shot most of Munich on location. Do you have any trouble with lighting setups in tight spaces? Do you have to sacrifice to change anything, especially on some of the longer shots going from room to room? Well, the, 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 particularly in Malta, some of the stuff that was shot at the, at the um, safe house was really difficult because it was just basically a rundown building with, with not really great access to the windows and stuff like that. But then you just simplify. You just make a one light that's really hot let it bounce from the walls and makes a makes a interesting style statement and also works for you in terms of the storytelling you know uh, it's better on location than in the studio because in the studio you've got all the freedom all the equipment not necessarily the time but all the freedom um, to move the walls and so forth but what you, what, you, what you don't have is actually the limitations and you don't have the background and no matter how much you work on putting artificial background outside the windows, it's always tiny bit looks artificially, you know. Uh, cool. Thank you. So locations are great, I love locations. Actually more than the studio. Mm. Thank you. Sure. The air is better too. In Malta, yes. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I had a question about um, when you're dealing with like an intense scene, how do you prepare um, like let's say the the opening of the same in private Ryan where there's so much action going on. How do you prepare for that? Well, you do tests. And then, you know, all that stuff that seems to be unprepared was very prepared and very rehearsed for one reason. You know, it takes about a week and a half to lay all the explosives. So, so if you blow it, you just blew it. You don't have a take. You know? so, you, so it was, you know, it was very much rehearsed. Everything was rehearsed. What was not rehearsed was the uh, speed of the actors as they travel into the scene. And just, you know, everything happens slightly different when you, when you actually have explosives blowing up next to you and you get the stuff flying. Uh, everyone gets a little bit more adrenaline. In terms of the visual uh, preparation, I that I've done very extensive tests, you know, in terms of uh, uh, how I'm going to manipulate the image, what is the technique I'm going to use, to what extent I will uh, 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 manipulate the images so they still look like you can follow the story, but they saw this disjoint that you almost feel like you're looking at something that's documentary, you know? Um, and you th I've tested that, you know? So I knew what I can achieve, what I, what I had to do, not necessarily convince the director, because the director was very easy to be convinced, but 
but to make him to fall in love with it. And he did, you know, which was great, you know. Actually, there was one, 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 uh, one instance when we started making the movie, which is the Omaha landing. Um, we shot for three days, and we didn't get the dailies for three days. And Steven usually looks at the scenes where, uh, where he's got the entire scene filmed. And I've seen the dailies, and I knew that, mm, you know, we're verging a little bit on, on, you know, student filmmaking here in terms of what I was doing, because... The images were very disjointed and looked glossy. Look, oh, there goes Tom Hanks. You can't even see him. <laughs> you know. And I was still, you know, working out. You know, on the treadmill. I had my treadmill losing weight. You know, his assistant comes in and says, "Stephen wants to talk to you." And he, had, he Stephen had his own editing room assembled on the location. So I'm going there. All right, there we go. <laughs> see you later. And he just loved what we've done. And he says, "Can we do it more?" I said, "Yeah." What did you do? You know? This, that. Okay, let's do it more. Okay, let's do it more. And that's what you want from the director. You don't want the director to say, "Oh, this is scary. I don't know. Maybe will the studio like it?" You know, you want you want the director to really like what you're giving him or her. You know, and that's when you fly. That's when you become the most um, uh, productive and, and and free. And I think that's the Steven's trademark. He he allows not allows. He gets that what's best in people because he doesn't allow us. We've got it. But he gets what's in us, and he he positively reinforces, reinforces our desires to be better. You know? And I think one of the good traits of the director is to hire great people who can make the movie for you. Of course, if they make a really bad movie, you tell <laughs> them, well, you know, I, I, I told him not to do it, but if the movie is good, yep, we all did it together. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. It takes some uh, secure director, though, to let yeah. everybody fly. Um, and here's a question while we wait for, hopefully, um, another student to queue up. Um, when you look at um, the sweep of time that you've been working in, say, from Cool as Ice uh, to now, um, what was the biggest change as far as the way movies are made that, that's affected you? The marriages were the biggest change. They just, <laughs> they just go away. <laughs> Yeah, the marriages disappear, so don't don't forget to live a life a little bit. Nothing changed really in terms of the storytelling, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't see any like young, bright, famous filmmakers evolving from the uh, digital generation, you know. I mean, yes, it's easier to make it, and anybody can make it. But there was something beautiful about necessity of raising money and and presenting yourself to potential investors, you know. Actually, making a little movie, I mean, you get three thousand entries to Sundance Festival, you know. 3,000, all those movies cost 500 to three, four million dollars, you know? And nobody wants them, you know? So I don't see any like major change in storytelling. It's faster, right? So that's one thing. I mean, you know, we don't have the patience to watch movies that, that evolve in a slower way. But, you know, I mean, look at what Academy Awards this year, you know? Great movies, great, slow, relatively slow movies. Yeah. Uh, some people say that um, maybe the um, pace of editing has gotten faster because more people are cutting with, uh, w you know, with uh, you know, Avid or FCP, where right. it's, it's easier to make a cut. Well, you know, just uh, I mean, the, the pace of life changed. Everything's faster, right? So, I mean, movies reflect the state of society, and and you know, if the mo if the society is moving faster, then we're getting faster movies. If the society is stagnated and and unimaginative, you're getting a whole bunch of horrible movies that we've made lately. <laughs> and now the society is a little bit more on the on the rise, you know, and we're making better movies. Mm. And we're seeing those movies. Hi, um, I'm Anna, and my question is: Once you won your first um, Oscar, does that add some pressure on your upcoming work in some way, like setting a new level, or I don't know, did you felt different? It gave me freedom. Winning an Oscar gave me total freedom, artistic freedom, and made me aware that yeah, I can do so much more because I don't have the, you know, I'm not being questioned. Not that I was questioned constantly, but, but this just gives you a bit more trust in what you're doing and, and encouragement, you know, a sense of um, pride and sense of, um, it gives you courage, in my opinion. I think it'd be great just to put the Oscar next to you on the dolly, and if anyone uh, questions you, you can just point to it. And my other question is, uh, of all your movies, which was the one that you enjoy doing the most? That's tough, you know, I mean, they're all great to some degree, you know. I mean, it's like, you know, which movie, which child would you give up? You know, take the girl, take the girl. Toma <laughs> will know where that came from. <laughs> they're all great, you know, I mean, you know. 
can't really, you know, it's, it would be unfair to the other movies, you know. Is it Schindler's Is it Munich? Is it, is it AI? Is it, you know, they're all great. Let's put it this way. Indiana Jones probably would not be the, the, the first choice. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's fun to do it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Question, but it totally flew away. Well, here's another uh, question, which <laughs> I get um, all the time. Can you talk about uh, Skip can Leech? Can always ask about the marriages. No. Can I ask about the marriages. Skip Leech or the marriages? Which which do you prefer? <laughs> Let's talk about Skip Leech. All right. Um, uh, talk about how you got turned on to it, or, or are you still using it as much as you sure. used to? You know, I, I think during the Amistad, which was what 2000, no, 80, 1980, 1996, I think. I was looking for a way to uh, debeautify the image. You know, it's it's a slave history. It would be totally wrong to have you know beautiful firework with pretty warm colors while all the guys are getting chained up and locked up in the prison, right? So I started investigating different processes, and and the process that I started using is it's not the process that really was invented for me. It was invented for Storaro, and. Hence, why his movies look so great, because he was the only one who was doing it for so many years. And once I did a little test, I realized, wow, I think I got a little, little, in I've got a little bit of advantage over other guys because it just becomes so much more beautiful. The whole image, images become more interesting, more beautiful. They have unique quality. The color saturation becomes different. The the, the shadows become different. Everything becomes more velvety, more gorgeous. You know. There are problems with it, but you learn that if you do it. Um, so yeah, that's how I discovered. Mm -hmm. And pretty much since 1995, every single movie I've done was with Beach Bypass. Uh, it seems, at least to, to my eye, um, when you uh, Minority Report and, and, and AI, that was kind of the, the kind of peak of it. It was really uh, you're really using. Uh, but War of the Worlds was also yeah, also was, was with Beach but with with ENR. You know, just the amount of how you use it, you know, and it doesn't have to be desaturated when obviously the process, which is a silver, silver retention process, which retains the silver and the emulsion, which desaturates the colors, knowing that that's what's going to happen, you just ask the color, color timer to put a little bit more color into, mm -hmm. the, into the positive, you know, mm -hmm. so it doesn't have to be saturated. And did you, um, for those movies, do you, when you do your um, final release, uh, Telesony, are you going off an IP, off the IN, yeah, off the yeah, print? Th it was all photochemical. Mm -hmm. All those movies we're talking about are photochemical movies, you know. Uh, but for, just for the DVD? No, no, no. For, uh, for DVD, sometimes I'll do it from the positive, from uh -huh. the print, because uh, you're just not able to really reproduce the, the, the quality of images if you if you um, going from the negative. Sometimes you, so you, I, I got, I know what you're asking me. So for example, when you do bleach bypass, you do it to the positive or you do it for the negative. Do not touch the negative. Let the negative be pristine. Although in Munich, I've had some scene where I manipulated the negative forever. So sometimes when you get a bit more strength, cojones, you know, you can do it. But, <laughs> but so when you do DVD transfer, you obviously the, the technology does not allow does not allow for the various reasons to reproduce the same tonal range as the film. So for the dark scenes or very contrasty scenes, you would bring the negative and you would do the DVD transfer from the negative. But for most of the film, you'd go from the positive that has the uh, uh, bleach bypass built into the, into the positive, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would have two, two uh, essentially I would have two uh, copies, one which would be positive print and another another uh, pile of film would be the negative so mm -hmm. every time i would have little problems with with getting the images out of the darkness i would go into negative you know mm -hmm. so that's what i would do uh, hello uh, my name is bachet uh well i speak livid russian don't get too okay. brave my friend <laughs> um can you tell you about uh paperwork uh, Paperwork? Yeah, pre preparing. Oh, preparing, and, right? Uh -huh. And uh, about the experience with Spielberg, how you did that stuff? Well, the preparation is very simple. Um, we go look at the locations, him and I once, and then uh, he comes back and we shoot the movie. That's the preparation. <laughs> uh, we may look at one film or we may not. You know, that's the preparation, really. Lately, when he's doing big movies like, um, like before he did small movies, but when he's doing big movies like Minority, not Minority Report, but Indiana Jones, he would spend weeks and weeks and weeks in 
in in um, animation studio where he would do the pre-visualization, pre-visualization, pre visualization pre whatever. <laughs> <laughs> what it's called, you know, it gets like a, like a animated storyboards, you know. So that's what he would do. That's his preparation. But you know, you know, it just sometimes we just don't talk at all. That's the problem. Do you talk about the theme of the movie? Do you talk about that? Mm. Well, it's in the script. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we don't, we don't go too intellectual about things, you know? I mean, yeah. Uh, my Very little preparation between him and I. Mm -hmm. Very little. Until I start doing the tests. So right now, I'm beginning to do tests for Lincoln, which we're going to photograph in October. So just very early of tests, where I'm doing some tests and I'm beginning to show him certain things. And, and the way I, I work is not necessarily that I know what this movie will look like, but I definitely know that it's not going to look like like a Robert Radford, Robert Radford's film. You know, the, the what is yeah. it called? The conspiracy. conspiracy. It's definitely not going to look like that. Uh, I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's not going to look like that. So I work by elimination. I eliminate <laughs> what I don't want this what I don't want this movie to look like. But between Steven and I, very little preparation. You know, we don't talk much about it. You know, <laughs> we may see one movie. You know. For for I think for Munich we saw Ipcris Files. That's the only film we've seen. You know, it's the trust. You know, and 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 knowing that you know the guy who's working who you're working with is the guy uh, that is really good for your movie. You know. But there's another way of working. You can sit and break down every single shot, create storyboards, create uh, uh, visual references. And I've done that. I've done that with Cameron Crowe and Jerry Maguire, where we sat through the entire movie and we did shot list and he did storyboards and stuff like that. If that's how he wants to work, that's how we do it. You know, Not my favorite part, but I'm capable to do that. <laughs> um, my second question, are you teaching or uh I'm a you horrible want in teacher. Future be I'm, I'm no, I can't teach. I, I'm not yet. Maybe, maybe I will not. I just don't have patience. You know, <laughs> I don't have patience to teach. Thank you. But I do take interns, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> I do, but not currently. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but I do take interns. <laughs> but currently, I'm not. Okay. It's like making the movie. You know, you find a way to get me a real. Well, we should really. Um, if anybody wants to ask a question, it's going to be the last question. Oh, so. come on, Tova, let them ask more questions. Really? Yeah, why not? What time okay. Is? Oh, it's nine. I'm just thinking that you have to go all the way to Venice. Oh, it's fast. <laughs> I have a fast car. <laughs> um, being so well known now and uh, experienced professional, do you still like working with just starting filmmakers? And if you do, is it how is it different from working with established? stars like Spielberg and I don't know if I know how to work with starting filmmakers you know I mean every filmmaker I've worked with they've done at least one film two films with Julian Schnabel he did three he did basket and he before so he did two films so um, you know I mean, it's not the amount of experience it's it's the story you want to tell you know um, I mean there are other you know logistics you know do I, you know, do I want to go and make a movie when I'm making very little money and I work really hard and nobody sees the movie? That's that's a big. It's not the money that I get paid, and it's not the filmmaker. It's 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 more like is the movie going to have an audience? Will this movie be seen? And that's very important to me, you know, because even with the good story, you know, you you may not find distribution, you know, um, and. I think that becomes much more important to me, whether the filmmaker is young or not, the story, and, 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 and are you able to going to put this movie on the big screen, you know? And my second question is, uh, when you work with uh, the same director for like several movies, uh, is it like different from uh, your experience than that when you worked with him for the sure. first time? Of course, because we, I mean, we've, we've started working with each other in 93, so it's almost, it's almost 18 years and we've evolved, you know. I mean, I was joking about the marriages and the kids, you know. I mean, he stayed with the same woman, I, I didn't manage to do that. <laughs> uh, but I have kids now and, and, you know, things evolve. I get older, I get fatter, you know, um, you know, that kind of stuff. He gets older and, and not fatter. Uh, I get <laughs> le less energy, he's got more energy, you know. And he's getting more mature, he's becoming more interested in things that 
that stimulate him intellectually, and his work is very much. Uh, uh, I mean, to me, it's very apparent that that his movies are getting more interesting. Um, yeah. What's the uh, at what stage is War Horse now? Well, War Horse is done. We start timing the movie. I think next month. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We promise to come for Jaws. We'll see if we'll get not, it. Not the last question. No. Uh, now that you are established uh, cinematographer, we're here all beginners, and we've talked a lot about your Spielberg era. Could you talk a little bit about pre-Spielberg era and the 13 years when you came to America and started on? I came to America in 1981. Uh, I spoke no English. I went to Chicago first. And I started learning English a little bit, for a year and a half. Then I started dating my teacher. That was really helpful. Jill <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rosenheim, she dumped me. She said, well, if you were somebody, I would have married you. She ended up marrying Joel Horowitz. Um, um, <laughs> broke my heart. But nevertheless, I managed to go to film school. <laughs> and Jill called me in 1994 and didn't say that she made a mistake. But she, she, <laughs> but, you know. So, um, so I went to Chicago, got my BA in Chicago, moved to Los Angeles in 87, went to AFI, and w when I was in AFI, I started working for Roger Corman. Um, as a gaffer a little bit, so shooting B camera, shooting second unit, you know, that eventually I went outside Roger Corman, shot a feature, came back to Roger Corman, shot a few features, then I did a couple of television film, fi films. And I was just gradually getting ready to, to, to have an interesting career. I was just about to do Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. That movie was already uh, given to me, which was my first bigger budget movie. And then, of course, simultaneously, I met Steven. And, and as he was making Jurassic Park 1, I was making um, Huckleberry Finn. And after that, I made a movie with him, which is Schindler's right? So Roger Coleman was great because we, we've done in two years, I've probably done 25 movies as a gaffer, and I shot three or four movies for him, you know, which is a really interesting experience. Um, right now, that kind of a, uh, uh, organization doesn't exist anymore. During that time, in the early 80s and, and 90s, there were some independent studios, you know, Cinetel and, and, New, and, and uh, Roger Corman, and there was another one, uh, Motion Picture Corporation of America. So there were a few independent entities that would make those low-budget, semi-exploitation movies, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how you start right now. I have no idea. Although some of the interns that I've had through my three years, they became bona fide cinematographers, and they're making, you know, okay living, and they're making movies, you know? So there's this entire world that I, of independent cinema that I have no uh, contact with, you know? Although I did win Spirit Awards. <laughs> I have to say that 90% of the people that come here um, somehow started with Roger Corman. 90% yeah. of the people from the 70s and 80s, some, you know, it's amazing that you came at 81 yeah. and you were still, he was still no, around. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but I've met Roger in 87, so, so it was the early, wow. yeah, early 90s. Early so he was still active. He was That's still active, yeah. Incredible. So, so my uh, my question for you, and, and by the way, uh, was, it, was, was it satisfying? Yeah, I have two more. Yes, oh. thank you very much. Go I have on. two more questions. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask about your school, film school experience. What was the most important? Um, I went to Columbia College, which is very much of a hands-on school. It's a relatively formal school, formal school where you don't have to um, commit to uh, any particular field. You know, I happen to like cinematography simply because it was the first thing. I've done when someone says you're good at it, you know. Uh, you're coming back from Eastern Europe, you know, you're not being rewarded as a child, you know. <laughs> and someone said you're good at it, right? And I just fell in love with it and gave me, gave me also uh, uh, very much of a concrete profession, you know. As an immigrant, you need a profession. You cannot be director because, because you're unemployed, right? Unless mommy or daddy puts the money in. Now you can make your own films, right? With, little digital camera and stuff like that. You still need a good story, right? So, but as a, as a cinematographer, I learned about like being electrician, camera assistant. I was horrible camera assistant. Very good electrician, very good grip, very good dolly grip. Um, so I had a concrete profession that would allow me to go and do a commercial uh, during my school year and make 250 bucks, and my rent was 280. <laughs> so it was pretty good, right? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was all about you know, making a little bit of money so you can pay the rent, you know? Uh, and believe me, nothing changes. 
you're still just making the money to pay the bills. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do understand. I do understand. And uh, last question. Actually, I'm not a cinematographer. I'm a student producer. So something that you would... You're rich? <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> so... Parents rich? Sorry? Your parents rich? No. I'm coming from Moscow. I'm not from Russia. Oh, there's but... money there. <laughs> but there is some money there, yes. Uh, what would you advise from like cinematographer's point of view to a producer? What is the relationship? What what should we think of? You should think of cinematographer. Who, you should think of cinematographer who has more experience than the director, simply because they will drive the production for you. Uh, they will they will they will um, set certain pace. They will uh, save you money. They will. They will drive the production. They're the engine of the production, you know. So it has to be someone who is more experienced than, than the director. You know? Thank you. Sure. I, I think you said once, um, uh, nothing we can do, um, nothing we, can, we do can make the director go faster, um, but we can certainly slow down a fast right. director. True. Um, but you can do a lot of things by, by for, not forcing the director, but just being ready and just saying, let's go. What's the next shot, you know? Mm -hmm. And if they resist, you just sit back and get bored and I've done one of those <laughs> stuff well I think um, uh, my, my last question for you would be that um, and, uh, and I know you make it look easy but you've had incredible uh, longevity uh, to your career Not much um, longer, baby. and All these um, young people are coming up <laughs> and I will die by the way so there will be opening <laughs> that was my thing when I came to Hollywood I'm thinking all those guys will eventually die well they're dying but I've made it a bit sooner <laughs> Well, maybe you just answered my question for me, but I, certainly I, I know. Um, <laughs> do you have any advice to folks um, long term, planning out the arc of a career? How, how do you make it last don't 25, 30 years? Don't give up. We will die off, and there will be opening. <laughs> Half, halfway serious, halfway joking. <laughs> last man standing. Always room at the top and the bottom, you know? It's just the middle. You don't want to be in the middle because it's just, you know, you don't want to be in the middle. There's a tremendous amount of room on the top. And you see that occasionally. Some new guy comes out, you know, some people from AFI just breaking through. Some people from Europe are coming in. You know, there's a young lady waiting. Um, I just want to ask about, do you like 3D? Or, like, how do you feel about it? Or do you just stick to No, no, I mean, I haven't seen a single 3D movie. Except Jonas Brothers, not Jonas Brothers. The, uh, uh, Bieber. Bieber, Justin Bieber, Justin Bieber, Bieber, whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have a son who is six and daughter who is six, and the girls stay, the boys left. You know, mm. after 15 minutes. So, uh, uh, whatever. So it's, been, it's been in existence. We've had 3D for 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 50 years. For you know. So you're not into it at all. I'm not into it because uh, I mean, you know, there's no, um, there's, there's no uh, need for me to be into it. When someone's got a movie that's interesting, that's good, and they want to do it in 3D, I will not give up on the job. I'll take the job. But you know. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. What uh, What have you learned from the mistakes, if there were any? Yeah, there are always mistakes. You learn from mistakes, dude. You know, I've made career out of mistakes. You know? <laughs> You know, out of focus, you know, shaky huh, camera, you know, flares, all that stuff, you know, uh, shutter that's weird, you know. So mistakes, if you have a movie that makes sense to apply the mistakes, you know, you could tell a nice story. But, you know, you learn that if you put a half filter and if it's red and looks great in the sky, but then you tilt up, everything changes, right? Or you pan across, the red filter goes across someone's face, you know. So I'll, I'll better I don't do that no more again. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I have a question. Um, how far do you get yourself involved in making storyboards? Well, I'm not, I don't like them. You know, usually the storyboards are, are being done with the storyboard artist. So it's primarily the director's objective to, to create the storyboards. We are invited to participate and some of us do. I prefer not to. It's just lengthy process, boring. I don't have the, I don't have the, you know, I, I want to go. That's flash. No, I don't have the patience. I have, you know, to sit. And, you know. 
it sounds very cute. It's not only cute when you have a son who is like you and he's six years old and you realize, <laughs> wow, that little fucker better finds a job one day. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, thank you. Well, some people do. I mean, you, you need to have, for certain movies, you need to have storyboards simply because you can, you know, everyone, everyone knows what, you, what we're doing, right? And Stephen does very elaborative, elabor very complicated storyboards frequently, especially for the action films, but not necessarily follows them, you know? It's for everyone to know what we're doing, you know? Other directors, they've got storyboards. If the actor smiles, the actor's got to smile, you know? <laughs> and they're very successful. They make great movies. You know, it depends how you want to do it. I think it's good. Automatically, it's good to have a storyboard, you know. Maybe not every single scene, but the key scenes, you, you want to have the storyboards. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, what was your experience like working with Judd Apatow and it's great. funny people? Judd was great. He's our industry itself. You know, it's very nice to be introduced to a totally different group of filmmakers, totally different system than, than Spielbergian, you know. He's surrounded by great Harvard-educated uh, uh, guys who are incredible, incredible writers. Um, the directional style is totally different. It's all improvisation, you know. Uh, we shot lots of film, uh, lots of film, several million, t million feet of film. Um, it was a great experience. He's a good man. He knows comedy. Um, he wants to make good movies, compelling movies. And he's not like his movies. He doesn't walk around and talks about cock and pussy all the time. You know? <laughs> It's usually the guys who cannot get laid, that's what they talk about. The guys, you know, Mark Wahlberg doesn't walk around and talks about, you know, <laughs> he actually gets it. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The Carpet Boys, you know. <laughs> and that was probably not appropriate. <laughs> Adam. Strike it. Uh, hi, I was wondering uh, what inspired your new uh, interest in directing now? I, was in, I started being more interested in, 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 in words, you know, in verbal storytelling, not just images, you know. And it's very exciting to direct. It's like riding a motorcycle, you know, you get out and it's just, you know, <laughs> it's scary. You know, you drive, you smoke a cigarette or you read your phone. Text. If you get a motorcycle, you fall down, boy, boy, you die. And that's directing. It's great. It's very stimulating. And it's exciting, you know. I would love to do it more, but probably I will not. Would you, would you venture into a feature? Sure, I've done two little movies. Yeah, one or two was not big. Was not little, was big. The revi revenues for were little, but the movie was big. <laughs> Hello, um, Isaiah from Greece. Um, I would like I to that. ask. <laughs> uh, I know other words too. <laughs> oh, you don't want me to tell them. <laughs> okay, Malaga. <laughs> yes, <laughs> even more. Yeah. But carry on. <laughs> yes. Um, I would like to uh, ask about uh, Schindler List. I think, from my opinion, is the best um, from uh, cinematography. Uh, about the red uh, color from the dress of the right. little girl. What is the meaning and if is your idea that, or? Well, it's not my idea. The, the movie is based on a book, and the, the little girl in the red dress was written into the, into the novel, right? Um, Stephen wanted to retain that aspect simply because it was uh, metaphorical and created this certain symbols, and you know, as you know, symbols, we individually, um, we individually, inter their interpretation is very individual, right? Technically, how we've done it, we've done it with shooting a color film, and then um, the image would be rotoscope, which I don't know if you guys know, but each frame would be hand uh, uh, painted and taken. The color was, was taken out, and then each print was hand spliced because obviously you cannot print color negative and black and white negative on the same print stack. So each print was hand spliced, at least in the in the primary market, and and that's the, that's the technique. That's how we achieve the. The, the brief moments of color in, 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 in black and white movie. Now, the meaning of it, whatever you think it is. Okay, thank you so much. Especially for great man, you have lots of the meaning, you know, <laughs> meaning of the, of the symbols. <laughs> Amparo. Hello, good night. I would like to ask you something about the cinematography of the Devin Bell and the Butterfly. I really love the movie. I think it's a kind of a visual poetry. And 
you. Uh, I like how you chose to shot the POV of the man. So I would like to know, I saw the, the, t the Swift and Tilt lens, Tilt mm. and Swift. Mm. So yes. did, did you change the speed or the shutter angle or something like this also in, this, in the first shots when he's waking up? Sure. I mean, you know, when he's waking up, I've got various techniques. One of them is, is a lens, it's called rubber lens, where it's basically a lens that if you, if you don't touch the lens, it's out of focus. But you know, when you grab the lens with your hand, you can selectively choose the focus, right? So it's called rubber lens. Then I used swing and, swing and shift lenses, and um, I had this focus puller changing the focus as the actors were talking. And on the top of it, I had several devices, such as speed control device, where I could change from 24 frames to 12 frames to 48 frames. So as he's waking up, you've got a lot of things going on. You've got the swing and shift. You get the uh, shutter change, which gives you this kind of a smearing effect. The focus is constantly changing, and the camera speed is changing. So when I go to an eye, most likely I'm at six frames, so the eye goes really weird. When I go to some kind of a section of the face to show, to, to, to show the muscles, twitching muscles, I go to six frames. But when I go to a mouth, when the actor is talking, I go to 24 frames to retain the sync, you know. So uh, it was a very elaborative, very uh, work-intensive process to, to get those images and very spontaneous, you know. I did some uh, tests, you know, but a lot of this stuff was, was just beyond being able to test, you know, you just, you just go on instinct, you know. And this was your decision or you talked before with the director or he proposed it, you proposed no, it? No, I've proposed it, definitely I've proposed it and, and I've done tests and I show him the tests, you know, to the point where, you know, I didn't know Julian that well, so I wanted him, I wanted him to see the images so he wouldn't be f afraid of them, you know. So yeah, it was all, a lot of it was prepared before. A lot of it was prepared before the principal photography, um, but you know most of it was done as we were making the movie. You know. Another thing that's very interesting is the hand crank, hand, hand cranked camera. When I'm cranking backwards and forwards, uh, the final scene when he's dying, it's all on camera effects. You know, there's no CGI. It's constantly cameras going forward and backwards as the people are coming in saying goodbye to him. I'm, I'm going forward with the film, literally having a hand-cranked camera, and I'm going forward and then going backwards as well. So I was layering images on the top of the other images, which I think was a very um, successful way of conveying the idea of someone dying. You know? mm -hmm. It's a beautiful, very beautiful job. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, too. So all the director has to do, basically, is just the direct the actors. You take care of everything else. It's not bad. I, I, I like those. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the best. I got another question. Um, how do you feel about digital, and where do you think the future of film is going? I think digital is getting better. I think it's it's in Europe. It's the norm. Nobody has the money anymore to make to make uh, movies and film. It's getting better. People are saying it's fantastic, you know. And what's interesting is we 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 we're in the process of not comparing it anymore. Each digital has its own language and, and you tell the story and, and the images are decent, you know, they look great. They don't necessarily look like film, but they look great, right? And, and now you do something on film with the, with the DI, you know, looks like bad digital. You know? yeah. I think that's, the, that's going to be the, the norm, you know, in five years there'll be no more film, you know. Um, it's, it's like the typewriter, bye-bye, you know. Still try to do typewriting, you know. But I still bemoan Polaroid. Yeah. It's all gone. Yeah. yeah so you. that's the that's my take, you know. I mean, it's the it's the it's not necessarily the future; it's the present right now. You know. Right. You know, you something to add digital to that? has been in the business for <laughs> a very long time. I mean, I went to AFI in '97, 1987, and. There was a movie done by Giuseppe Rotuno, I think, the first high-definition movie, you know, in 87. It was a feature, you know, it was pretty, pretty interesting, you know. So it's like 22 years now, you know. It took that long to finally become a, a common tool, you know. But, you know, I, this little camera right there, it's pretty great. I shot with it as a director. I shot right into the sun, it was great. Actually, better than the Sony FP stuff, you know. But who do I know? <laughs> I have very little experience with digital. You look like you had something to add to that. Did you want to add something to that? No. No, no, I meant. Pova? No. She just wants to okay. get going. You look like you're going to ask him. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, um, I think... Swedish, that's it? One yeah. more, adults? That's it. We're really honored that, that you can join Thanks us. Let's give them a big thank hand. Thank you, guys.